Hi guys, hope you're all doing good and hope your preparation is on track. Today, on the 27th of November 2023, let us look at some of the important issues of the day. To just uh, update you that yesterday, that is November 26th, was known as or is known as Constitution Day. The reason why it's declared as Constitution Day is on this day in the year 1949, our Constituent Assembly, our Constituent Assembly adopts the Indian Constitution. The Indian Constitution is the most successful document in the history of democratic world and hence it is a day to celebrate and the day is on November 26th. Okay, And today on the 27th of November 2023, it is the day of Guru Purab or it is the day of Prakash Purab. That is today is the day of Guru Nanak Jayanti and we should celebrate not only the Sikh community but also the entire Indian community must celebrate this day because of the values that is enshrined by Sikhism to Indian society and to Indian community. The action oriented philosophy, the selfless service oriented philosophy is something that is applicable to each and every community in India. And we have to strive by the values enshrined in the Guru Granth Sahib. With that, with all the wishes, let us go to the first issue of the day. The first issue of the day is since it is Guru Nanak Jayanti, we have to learn uh, issues that can come from exams perspective. Okay. So Guru Nanak Jayanti is celebrated as Guru Purab or it is also celebrated as Prakash Purab. Guru Nanak Ji was, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the Guru Nanak uh, Ji's uh, birth year was 1469 and this marks the 554th birthday. This marks the 554th birthday of Guru Nanak Ji. Okay. He was the founder of Sikhism and he enshrined the values that are now uh, present in the written format in Guru Granth Sahib. So, Guru Granth Sahib is the holy scripture of Sikhism and this holy scripture of Sikhism contains the truth and philosophy and values that were taught by Guru Nanak Ji. It is considered as the final sovereign and eternal Guru by all Sikh community and this Guru Granth Sahib consists of over 900 hymns or that hymns are also known as Shabda. Okay, it consists of 900 hymns or Shabda. Okay, this Guru Granth Sahib is read continuously. It is read continuously as Akand Pat. It is read continuously as Akand Pat two days before. It is read continuously as Akand Pat before two days before Guru Purab and this is done in every Gurudwara. So every Gurudwara, there will be uh, Guru Granth Sahib that will be read continuously, which is known as uh, Guru, I mean Akant Pant. Okay. So this is uh, about the introduction of the Guru Nanak Jayanti, which is called as Guru Purab. Okay. Now to talk about the philosophy and values enshrined by uh, Guru Nanak Ji. Okay. Let us first talk about the philosophy of Ik Onkar. Okay. Ik Onkar is nothing but the concept of one God and the concept of oneness of God. Okay. That is, there is one God, though we have different religion, though we have different communities, though we have different means to celebrate and pray um, God. Eventually, there is one God and hence this concept brings all human beings together. Okay, so this is what is Ik Onkar. The second concept is the Guru Nanak Ji's philosophy emphasized on three important pillars. Okay, or it revolved around three core principles. The three core principles are one Naam Japna. Okay, the second is Kirat Karna. And the third is Vand Chakna. Okay. Nam Japna is remembering and chanting names. 
Nam Japna is remembering and chanting names. Kirat Karna is emphasizing on honest living. And Vand Chakna is sharing amongst others. Okay, so these are the three core principles on which the philosophy of Sikhism stands. The next philosophy that the Sikhism is uh, known for is Sarbat the Bala. Okay, this means welfare of all. Okay, so what this means is em Guru Nanak Ji emphasized on the working of the common good. The working for the common good, working for the common good, which extends beyond the boundaries of, which extends beyond the boundaries of caste, creed and nationality. It extends beyond the boundaries of caste, creed and nationality. So this is the fourth concept of uh, Sikhism that I'm trying, I, I'm, I would like to introduce. The next concept is, they introduce a concept called Langar. This means community kitchen. Community kitchen is one uh, remembering everyone of selfless service and also helping the marginalized, the poor and the needy. Okay, so it brings together all people together on a common platform. That is the idea of Langar. Okay, the next is the Guru Nanak Ji's teaching helped promote three important things. One is, as I told you, oneness of God. The second is equality of all human beings. And the third is the importance of selfless service. See, the important thing that you should know about the philosophy of Sikhism is, the important thing about the philosophy of Sikhism is, all uh, other philosophy uh, made uh, you know, a, a person who is into Bhaktism to move towards sacrificing their active life. Okay, sacrificing their active life. But it was Sikhism which actually promoted, it was Sikhism which was actually promoted active life. It told that you have to lead an active life. You should not withdraw from be leading an active life. However, this active life should have work that must be done honestly. And it should not result in hoarding of wealth. And it should result in selfless service. Okay. So it was the one uniqueness of Sikhism, which is a part of Bhaktism, is it always was a proponent of active life. Okay. It never told people to uh, go away from the active life, to uh, indulge in isolating oneself. But it always was a proponent of taking part in the community, leading an active life, having a job, working honestly and working selflessly for the community and the people. So that is one of the uniqueness of the you know uh, Sikhism and the teachings of Guru uh, Guru Nanak Ji. So I hope you got the uh, you know philosophical uh, uh, you know uh, backing or philosophical ideology of Guru Nanak Ji's teachings. Okay. Now this can come as a question in both prelims as well as mains and in mains you should not wait for them to ask about Guru Nanak Ji or about Sikhism but you should be able to push these values in your answers in either case studies or in the theory part. Okay. So that is what is called smartness. So I hope this concept was clear. Please use always see Mirabai has been in news because of the celebration of 525 years of anniversary of Mirabai. So you should have some amount of notes with philosophy and keywords done about Mirabai that can come in prelims also that can come in mains also. So this has to be done on the basis of whichever personality is in news. So I hope you understood this particular concept. Okay. The next concept is why Finland is blaming Russia for the sudden influx of migrants on its eastern border. Okay, now Finland, what has happened is now Finland became a member of NATO earlier this year. Earlier this year, Finland became the member of NATO. Okay, and because Finland has become a member of NATO, it is blaming Russia that the influx of migrants coming into Finland is because of Russia facilitating them to enter. Okay, the reason why uh, Finland is accusing Russia of doing this is 
the western democracies the western democracies have come up with the concept called uh, hybrid warfare okay they have come up with the concept called hybrid warfare so according to the hybrid warfare they are accusing russia of using one means to destabilize western democracy is through migrants okay let me just elaborate what this hybrid warfare is if i take hybrid warfare this is a concept that the western democracies western democracies have used this concept to accuse russia okay so they accuse russia to destabilize their democracy to destabilize their democracy in three ways okay one is by the use of these migrants they will push this migrants who are coming from eastern europe they will push this migrants who are coming from eastern europe and africa into the uh, you know these democracies to destabilize the democracy okay that is one way of doing it the second is they try to spread misinformation they try to spread misinformation and they try to intervene in the elections of these democracies and the third is through cyber attacks okay so in these three manner 1 2 and 3 these three manner the western democracies are accusing russia of destabilizing their democracy which they have given the term as hybrid warfare again what you have to remember as a narrative is this is nothing but a perception spread by the western democracies okay how true is it is still to be proved however what is true is the migrant influx is happening along the border of uh, you know uh, of finland and it is uh, uh, you know it is accusing russia of uh, you know pushing these uh, you know migrants now because the issue is in the realm of international relations you should always go back to mapping and learn the different countries the different uh, you know regions that are in specific very important for this issue so for that let us come here now if you can observe uh, first let me show you this look at this this is the border shared by russia with finland okay this is the border shared by russia with finland okay so it is here where you see that the migrants are influxed into finland via russia okay now another keyword is nordic countries they use it as nordic countries or they can also call it as scandinavian countries okay they can also call it as scandinavian countries okay so what are the scandinavian countries as you can see in this diagram scandinavian countries are basically five countries norway sweden finland iceland and denmark okay now when you read in the internet scandinavian countries are see when they say denmark these regions are also under the part of denmark greenland and faroe islands okay so the, if they give you these two words that means they are also part of scandinavia so you have norway sweden third is finland after that is iceland okay remember there are more than 26000 uh, you know earthquakes that iceland faces we learned this in the concept called earthquake swarms okay we learned this in the concept called earthquake swarms so fourth is iceland and the fifth is denmark so if this is denmark the foro islands also belong to denmark greenland also belongs to denmark so hence denmark is also a part of nordic countries or scandinavian countries see in scandinavian language nordic means northern islands in scandinavian language nordic means northern islands so these northern islands are these five nations norway sweden finland iceland and denmark which includes greenland and faroe islands okay now there is one more uh, uh, term that is used that is baltic countries okay one more term that is used that is known as baltic countries now if you see this is the baltic sea here you have finland this side is russia remember this is the russia finland border okay you can look at this this is the russia finland border and if you can see three nations here estonia latvia and lithuania these three nations estonia latvia and lithuania are known as baltic countries okay and look uh, these only these three are known as baltic countries don't put other things here one one more thing what you need to observe is can you see kaliningrad so kaliningrad is part of russia and it has its border in baltic sea okay so that is one more observation that you have to do so i hope this observation was helpful and you understood what is the concept of hybrid warfare
okay so this is about the concept of finland accusing russia of pushing migrants into its borders okay the next issue is molding the himalayas needs caution okay basically the author is talking about the developmental projects happening in the author is talking about the developmental projects that are happening in the himalayan indian himalayan region okay so the author talks about the uttarkashi tunnel collapse which has thrown light on the major flaws in the infrastructural development in the indian himalayan region okay so that is why the author tells that we have to be cautious in the developmental projects that occur in the himalayas the reason why this article is important is the article very beautifully gives two case studies one case study is about chardam project one case study is about chardam project okay the author tells how this is not following the safety protocols and the another case study that the author gives is atal tunnel okay and the author tells this particular project has followed all the safety protocols okay so you can use these case studies in your answers again you need not wait to use it for them to ask you this question you can use this as a case study for negligence of work for uh, you know uh, mis mal administration misgovernance so you can use this case study for this you can use it in the case studies which shows efficiency effectiveness transparency expertise and specialization so you need not wait for them to ask you this question you can use this case studies anywhere now to just elaborate on these case studies the first case study is the char dam project okay so char dam project is nothing but connecting four religious places or four religious pilgrimage center pilgrimage centers linking four religious pilgrimage centers that is kedarnath badrinath gangotri and yamunotri okay linking these four uh, you know uh, religious places via road via roadways is what is the chardam project okay this is happening uh, or this is being done by national highway authority of india okay now the reason why the author tells that this particular project is not following the safety norms is because look at this one the, uh, the author says that north of this project north of this project there is a huge fault line there is a huge fault line north of this project and that fault line is known as central main thrust the huge fault line is known as central main thrust okay this fault line can trigger earthquakes it can trigger shear uh, it can trigger uh, shivers okay that shivering can again trigger landslides it can trigger landslides okay so that is the first uh, you know uh, uh, point that the author like to highlight the second the author tells that nhai after the uttarkashi tunnel uh, you know uh, incident has now told that it will undertake 29 tunnels detailed study don't you think that this is a post mortem analysis being done by nhai after an incident has occurred this shows that they had not taken the safety norms before and now they are concerned about the different tunnels that they have built the third is that if you take environmental impact assessment see chardam project is one power project that runs for 960 or 900 kilometers long this is one long road and one single project however in order to flout the norms or in order to circumvent the regulatory framework what they had done is they had split this project into 53 smaller sections okay in order to escape the regulatory framework they had split this project into 53 smaller sections and hence they got the clearance now this again shows that there is very very less regard for safety concerns okay so this is a case study that shows one there is negligence two there is circumvention of rules three you are not implementing uh, the law in spirit okay so all this are different ways you know i can use this case study okay again to repeat this chardam project is a uh, you know highway project that links four religious pilgrimage science centers kedarnath badrinath gangotri and yamunotri however the problem that is happening is north of this project there is a fault line which is known as central main thrust 
the that again is very serious because it can trigger earthquakes shivering effect that in turn can trigger landslides the second is nhai has now uh, told that it will undertake detailed study on all the different tunnels that it has constructed the 29 tunnels the third is the floating of eia norms which shows that safety concerns were neglected in this particular project okay the next is the next case study that the author tells is about atal tunnel okay so atal tunnel is a tunnel that is built by border road organization and it is a tunnel that connects manali in himachal pradesh to leh in ladakh it connects manali in himachal pradesh to leh in ladakh and it is a tunnel that is built under rohtang pass it is built under rohtang pass okay and the reason why this case study is good is because the border road organization has used new austrian it has used new austrian tunneling method it has used new austrian tunneling method the second is it has used fire hydrants at regular interval the third is it has also used avalanche control structures it has used avalanche control structures uh, also within the tunnel okay in order to stop any type of avalanches from happening so all this shows that uh, you know this tunnel has been created by the border road organization by making safety as the top priority okay so the author tells usually what happens organizations are more towards target they want to get things done but in indian himalayan region it is not the case so because in indian himalayan region safety protocols as well as safety standards will always override targets so that is what the author says and on this regard the author has given these two case studies on how the developmental projects in the future must happen okay so this is regarding the uh, indian himalayan region i hope you got to know what the author is telling why we should be cautious in any type of developmental project that happens in the himalayas okay so use this case studies uh, at your discretion they are very very good case studies the next issue is why is bihar demanding special category states okay so first of all let us understand what is this special category states okay it is basically a status uh, a special category status is a status that is granted by the central government it is granted by the central government the second is it was started as a concept in 1969 by fifth finance commission it started as a concept in 1969 by fifth finance commission and special category status is granted on the basis of five factors the first factor is hilly and difficult terrain the first factor is hilly and difficult terrain the second factor is low population density or sizable tribal population low population density or sizable tribal population the third is strategic location along international boundary strategic location along international boundary okay that is the uh, third criteria the fourth one is economic and infrastructural backwardness economic and infrastructural backwardness and the fifth is non viable nature of state finances non viable nature of state finances okay so special category status is a state is granted by central government it was started in 1969 and it was first uh, you know conceptualized in fifth finance commission and it is based on the five factors if these uh, if uh, among these five factors anything matches only then will the central government grant the special st category status okay so they are hilly and difficult terrain low population density or and or sizable tribal population strategic location along international boundary economic and infrastructural backwardness non viable nature of state finances okay so in the year 1969 when this concept was introduced three states were granted special category status and they were jammu and kashmir assam and nagaland okay these were the three states which were granted the special category status currently along with this three eight more are granted special category status they are arunachal pradesh manipur meghalaya mizoram sikkim 
Tripura, Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand. Okay, so you have 11 states totally that have the special category status. Okay, now how to remember this is Sikkim plus 7 northeastern states plus Jammu Kashmir, Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand. Okay, so 3 plus 4 plus 7 this creates 11 states. So these are the states that have or that have the special category status. Now, what is the point of having special category status is the centrally sponsored schemes. Okay, the advantage of having a special category status is the states having this status with respect to centrally sponsored schemes, they will have to share 90 is to 10 that is 90 percent of the fund will be contributed by the central government 10 percent should be contributed by the state government now if you have do not have the status it is mainly 60 40 that is 60 from the central and uh, 40 from the state so the contribution significantly reduces in case of centrally sponsored schemes if you have the status of special category status okay the next is there is a lot of concessions there is a lot of concessions with respect to excise with respect to customs duty okay with respect to income tax with respect to corporate tax so all this are less in special category status so this will attract investments it will attract investment the best example is you can see a lot of pharmaceutical industries pharmaceutical industries that are located in Uttarakhand. okay this pharmaceutical industries that are located in Uttarakhand is an example of Uttarakhand enjoying the special category status which in turn is because of which you have a lot of incentives with respect to excise customs duties income tax and corporate tax since everything is low these uh, industries are going and setting it up in Uttarakhand. so this is one way how to attract investment and this is how special category status helps in attracting investment and in also helping attract central funding okay there was one more uh, you know advantage of what was the advantage is 30 percent of the total uh, you know um, assistance central assistance to states if you take central assistance to states 30 percent of it was dedicated to special category states however with the coming of 15th finance commission this was not there so this is no more there so don't worry about it okay with the coming of 15th finance commission the 30 percent of the total central assistance to be dedicated to special category status is not there anymore okay so this is fine so apart from this these are some of the advantages enjoyed by the uh, special category status and since why is we are asking for special category status is one it says that because of jharkhand being separated from bihar it lost most of its resource rich area so jharkhand was separated from bihar so it lost its resource rich area the second it says that the bihar has suffered from a lot of floods and other uh, you know such events the third is it says that bihar has high level of poverty that is economic backwardness so on these lines because it has lost resources suffering from floods and suffering from poverty it says that bihar is eligible for the special category status however the eligibility is always decided by the central government and it is always the central government's call to, to whether decide to bring it under the special category status or not so i hope you understood what is the meaning of special category status when it came into picture and what are the different parameters of special category status okay let's go to the last issue of the day the last issue is president draupadi murmu advocates all india judicial service exam for judges selection the this all india judicial service aijs this is something that is present in the article 312 of indian constitution according to article 312 of indian constitution uh, the constitution allows uh, creation of all india judicial service however this should not include this should not include any post any post that is inferior to it should not include any post that is inferior to that of district judge it should not include any post that is inferior to that of district judge so this is very important for you to remember okay so article 312 allows the uh, you know uh, the establishment of all india judicial service but this should not include any post that is inferior to district judge okay now what does this mean this means just like you have a recruitment exam for ias ips 
as well as IRS, you should also have a recruitment exam for IAJS, that is All India Judicial Service. So, judiciary is also an All India Service and having a recruitment that is based on merit and transparency will help attract youth. It will help attract youth into ju judiciary. That is the main idea. Okay. So, the argument that the President Murmu makes, one is the such All India Judicial Service will create uh, three things. One, it brings uh, equal representation. It brings equal representation of India's diversity. It brings equal representation of India's diversity in Indian judiciary. Currently, Indian judiciary does, does not or is not representative of India's diversity. By bringing All India Judicial Service, it brings equal representation of India's diversity in Indian judiciary. The second is people can be recruited. People can be recruited from various backgrounds. They can come from various backgrounds. And this uh, people who come from various backgrounds can be screened on the basis of an exam that will be based on merit and transparency. Just like how we have the UPSC exams, which is written by people coming from various backgrounds of engineering, doctor, arts, science in the same manner, having an all India judicial service will also open up the recruitment of people coming from various backgrounds and that will create a, a you know, representation of people which are highly diverse, not only from their social angle, but also from their professional angle. The third is it will help create a pool of talents. It help creates a pool of talents. Now this pool of talents will also address the issue of social inclusion. It will also address the issue of social inclusion because it provides representation for the marginalized. It provides representation for the marginalized and deprived sections of the society. Okay, so these are the three important arguments that the president makes for having the All India Judicial Service to be uh, executed or implemented as soon as possible. One is it gives diversity in India's judiciary. It recruits from various backgrounds and also it creates what we call as social inclusion in Indian judiciary and it in turn will help in creating a pool of talent. As we know, judiciary is suffering from lack of manpower. We are having huge, uh, you know, pendency of cases. So having All India Judicial Service will not only attract more youth into judiciary, but also will improve the amount of cases that can be disposed of, which in turn will improve the trust amongst the people with respect to Indian judiciary. But what is happening? The issue, the main issue of why All India Judicial Service is not yet implemented, though there has been several cases of it being a, uh, you know, idea that can be implemented. The issue is there is divergence of opinions there is divergence of opinions among states and i courts okay some state government and i courts are in favor of all india judicial service some states and i courts are not favorable for uh, you know uh, uh, the all india judicial service the reason is because this all india judicial service is to do with the appointment of district judges and in the appointment of district judges the state government and high court have an important role to play so some states want to use this as a progressive means other states and high courts see this as uh, you know uh, withdrawing of their power regarding the appointment of district judges okay so that is uh, the issue that is currently happening in creating a deadlock in implementing all india judicial service which is given in article 312 of indian constitution okay so i hope this issue was clear and I hope you, uh, you know, uh, got an idea of all the important issues of today. If you like these videos, please make sure that you share, like and subscribe the, uh, you know, the, uh, our channel. And please make sure that you spread this particular uh, initiative to your friends as many, as many as possible. Thank you guys. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.